So good afternoon, the brave souls who've stayed to the very end. Thank you very, very much. Um, yeah, my role today is really just to, to clarify what citizen science is, so just explore a bit and clarify it a bit, and then just explain how the data center itself approaches citizen science. And so that particular phrase, citizen science, has been mentioned by every single speaker so far. So I think it's timely now that we actually take a bit of a deeper dive and hopefully enthuse you about how rigorous citizen science can now be. So starting off, okay, just what is citizen science? So at its simplest, it's really just the involvement of volunteers in research. But please don't think that the volunteers themselves just are the general public. In many cases, they are the vast majority of people who are involved. But for particular projects, because again, citizen science can be a genuine research approach, you can have a whole sort of uh, 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 an integration of different skill sets. Sometimes we have uh, um, uh, qualified uh, sort of professional ecologists giving freely of their time. Sometimes we have academic scientists giving freely of their time or volunteering themselves in citizen science uh, projects. So it isn't always just the general public. You can actually have a whole range of different skill sets contributing to the successful delivery of, of a particular project. And like that, um, there's particular fields that have done incredibly well in, 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 in sort of advancing um, citizen science. So clearly, you're here to, we're talking about, uh, today we're talking about ecology, but also the meteorology and astronomy, and people sort of forget that. Because at the very start, when they were starting out as scientific disciplines, uh, particularly in terms of like meteorology, this image on the left is a meteorological station that would have been close to Tinahili in Wicklow, where people physically collected the data and then reported that data. I mean, initially by post and then by telegraph and then ultimately by email. And then as technological solutions took over, it sort of uh, removed the need for people to be involved in those particular scientific fields. And I'm always curious to think, uh, how more broadly accepted the, the, the message we're getting in terms of climate change is right now, if we still had loads of people physically on the ground actually collecting the data. They've been a little bit removed for it, for all the right reasons. And one of those technological solutions in terms of satellites, remote sense imagery, and um, synoptic stations and automated stations, I mean, have taken over that role of data collection for all the right reasons. But still, maybe injecting a little bit more people back into the system might actually ha have improved um, our ability to take on its messages. So the same thing happened with astronomy. Again, that's a picture of a, a, a club of mostly men, male astronomers, back in the 1860s in Dublin. And again, we've moved on from that. Again, there's a large-scale technological solution to how we now study astronomy uh, as a scientific discipline. But in all this, you're getting a sense that really uh, a lot of scientific studies, in the most case, do not have the resources to be conducted over large spatial scales or long time periods. And that's where citizen science really has its niche. That's where it really succeeds as a genuine scientific approach. And uh, like that, okay, given for those other disciplines where these large scale technological approaches have come in and taken over, well, why is it so, still so popular? Why, if anything, is it more popular than it's ever been before? Exploitation of the masses, it's cheap data collection. Uh, no, it's not, no, it's not. But that's one of the first things that some people quite cynically see citizen science as. It's a way of um, bringing in quite a lot of people just to give you data and then go away. Yeah, we don't want anything to do with you. Just give us the cheap data and go. But it really is not that. That's it, that's it. Um, uh, citizen science, not as a science, that's just uh, effectively just exploitation at its worst. So our uh, wonderful uh, co-conspirators in the uh, German citizen science platform have this very systematically uh, collated table of all the good things that citizen science can do. So like that, let's go through them point by point. No, no, we'll just one or two things. Uh, one of the first ones I really feel is that it allows us ask research questions, and in this instance, it's conservation research questions, over much larger spatial scales or over much longer periods of time than we can do with conventional resources for science. So, I mean, it's really good. It opens up the number of hypotheses we can now test at spatial scales that we need to test them to actually uh, protect species and habitats. Also like, uh, like that, I think a very important thing is this uh, point on the side, if I can figure this out very quickly. No, I can't figure this out very quickly. There we go. Okay, is it on the side? Uh, thank you, yeah. Oh, there we go, yeah. So uh, it promotes the public evaluation of research, involves people in actually, okay, why are we doing this research? What's it going to achieve? What are the outcomes over a particular period of time? Is it of value? That's a, having that public oversight, and I think it was even mentioned in relation to the indicators we're on today. 
about having that public involvement in the development of scientific research. I think it's really, really quite important. In terms of society, I think uh, one of the core outcomes is uh, a science literate citizenry. So when you involve people in science, and we hear about STEM education now, but when you directly involve them in citizen science, you're showing them the whole data flow from the field into data, into analysis, into report, into information, into decision being made. You, you're, they're involved in that process. So by being involved in that process, they're far more likely to actually take on those decisions and actually act out uh, on that information because they understand where it comes from. So it's a really, again, a really key part of uh, supporting citizen, citizen science that, okay, here again, it's within ecology, within conservation, but you get a sort of uh, uh, conservation science literate population then that understand how things have to be done to get the best data so we can have the best, cons uh, best conservation. And then, of course, for the participants themselves, there's a whole range of different motivating factors of why people want to get involved. Sometimes they sort of fall into it and they end up doing citizen science. Oh, this is fun, but I just really enjoy going out and doing these walks. Or other cases, they have a very specific goal. They're a friends of group. They have a particular location that they're very passionate about conserving and want to get the best data for it. So there's a whole, there's a whole range there. But ultimately, in most cases, people really have that sort of genuine feeling of contributing to something important, something of value that's going to have uh, direct benefits for something they really care about. And we can facilitate that in any way. That's exactly what we want to do. Again, going back to, oh, it's cheap data collection. It is, when done really badly, yeah, it can be. But if you're actually going to do it right, ultimately, it's science. So right at the start, you need a scientist to set out, okay, if you're going to ask that question, this is the best methodology. And then you're going to need someone, again, typically a scientist, to trial it. Okay, this is what we think is going to work. Let's go out and do it. Did it work? No, it didn't. Let's go back, iterate, and do it again. After that, then, you need to pay somebody with the technical expertise to actually train your citizen scientists, to go out, uh, develop all the teaching material, petrol, hall rental, all the rest, all those resources you need to teach people. And from our own experience within the data center, you're talking a minimum of one or two years before you even have a handful, maybe 20 or 30 people who have the capacity to actually do your, your citizen science subjects. So it isn't something that's, it's not a quick fix in any way. It, it is a, sort of more of a longer term commitment uh, uh, to uh, this particular research approach. And then finally, <coughs> ourselves, the coordinators. So once you have it developed and trialed, and rolled out, you have the people ready to go, you then need to oversee the development of that project. You need to recruit in new people the whole time, value and support the existing recorders that are there. Uh, again, iteratively go through um, uh, reviews of how it's performing, all the rest. And of course, then at the, at the end of the day, the platform that the data center provides is ultimately the infrastructure, the data management, the analysis and the reporting on those data. And all of that has to happen for the whole lifetime of the project. And I've already said that, again, citizen science typically works best over large spatial scales or long periods of time. So like that, again, it is not cheap. Like if you're going to do it right, it has to be properly resourced. And again, that's already borne out in the data. And so when we look at this sort of whole screen of over uh, 230 different citizen science projects, the vast majority, are, again, are what we would call sort of, um, a thorough study. The, the, uh, what you're asking the citizen science to do is something a little bit more involved and complex than just simply taking a photograph and then walking away. You're actually asking to do some sort of quantitative uh, relevé or walk or something a little bit more involved. So that's what most people ask their citizen science to do. And then after that then, in terms of scale, citizen science can be done at the local scale, at a field scale or a site scale, but it's typically more employed really when you have multiple sites that need to be covered in multiple areas, so that mass participation, you need a lot of people. So that is the shape of citizen science, really. That's where, uh, how most people uh, are, are actually doing it. Again, citizen science, it's almost like a trademark term. And it, it, it is deserving of protection because it can be abused. And so the two different associations worldwide, really, at the moment, that are involved in sort of establishing a best practice for citizen science. If you're going to do it, this is really how you should do it. Again, are largely in the Americas, with the Citizen Science Association, and here in Europe, the European Citizen Science Association, of which the uh, data center is, is a member. So again, let's go through all 10 principles of what is, no. I'll very quickly say, look, it just has to be genuine science. That's it. It just has to be actual science. I know that sounds obvious, but the study should be designed to falsify a hypothesis. 
That's really that simple. If the study cannot answer that question, well then it's not really science, it's something else. After that then, I would emphasize that again, citizen science is a research approach like any other. It's just a way of doing research. Um, like that, it can't do everything. And I'll get onto that in the next second, when, we should, when should we use citizen science? But it can do an awful lot. And again, as soon as those scales of time and space get large, it's really, it's a very good way of doing it well, of doing big science. And then finally, again, it should always be evaluated for its scientific up output, its data quality, particularly the participant experience. We really want people to enjoy what they're doing. They're giving their time freely. So you want to make sure that they're happy and confident that they're doing it correctly and actually really enjoying it. Because in terms of keeping people within citizen science and making sure that they uh, continually are making a valuable contribution, you have to value them too and make sure that they're, they're, they're happy. And then finally, the data itself. It should have impact, both in terms of uh, directly informing on policy and actually direct change on the ground. So when should we not, or should, use citizen science? So there's an excellent publication, again, Choosing and Using Citizen Science, um, uh, published by uh, Matthew Pocock, who is now involved with the um, Planet Monitoring Scheme within the UK. But they have this lovely table that ultimately serve, these are the, serve when citizen science is done best and is most successful. It's typically when you have a really clear question. If you're at a stage where you need a lot of preliminary studies to really identify what's happening within a system, no, that's best done, again, with sort of conventional academic research or ecological research. No, if you have a really, already have a really clear question that you need to ask, and again, typically for me, it's over large spatial scales, and citizen science is a really, really good tool. Like that, engagement should be important. You generally want to inform the people involved in the study about why that study is needed and why they are so important. If you are literally saying, I could replace you with a drone, but then don't do it. You know, you really shouldn't just say, I just want you for your frontal lobe. You know, you want them for, that's effectively it. I mean, you, you, you want them involved, you want them educated about what you're trying to achieve. And then when the results come out from that study, they really believe them and they have a sense of ownership because they've genuinely contributed to that study. So it's really, really very important. Again, complexity of protocol. Frankly, I think that's a little bit less important. Um, it is if it's very complicated, and particularly if there's any kit needed. If you need something that requires an awful lot of equipment, again, there's a cost to that, and um, there's a replacement cost when things go missing or broken in the field, all the rest. I think as soon as you start moving towards that space, that's when the size of the study must become a little bit more modest. And then again, it's not so much of a national or international scale, it's maybe more of a regional or local scale. But overall, look, we want to make sure people are happy doing it. They're giving freely of their time, genuinely value that contribution. And again, this has happened. It's happening already. Again, the number of worldwide Google searches for citizen science, uh, the number of publications with citizen science as a term within Google Scholar. There's a bit of a fall off there in 2018, but like most academics, they leave everything last minute. So December will be loads of publications coming out. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's really gained traction as a genuine research approach, approach uh, worldwide. And then moving into the policy sphere, again, now that citizen science is being done well, and you can really identify, you can really uh, uh, illustrate that it is a rigorous scientific approach um, in terms of its involvement directly within sort of, uh, reporting obligations at a regional level, in this case with the Joint uh, Research Council. This publication came out in 2018, specifically recommending best practice guidelines uh, about how to integrate citizen science data within current reporting practices. So they really want to start using citizen science because they see its value, both in terms of the scientific rigor of how the data is now being collected, but also in terms of the genuine engagement of the people who've collected that data, who now really want to see change. So how do we do it, given all this? So when everybody else is doing it, how are we doing it? Well, we support sort of citizen science over a whole sort of, uh, ra uh, 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 range of, uh, of activities. So just going from the least effort, just experiential, just getting people involved with biodiversity and wildlife, just getting people out there and experiencing it. But particularly through our oh, it's almost uh, uh, no, um, 3,000 people trained through our workshop program, it goes beyond just the simple sort of nature walk, it's now, oh look, there's a butterfly, but now it's, oh look, there's a green veined white. Oh, that's a little bit early this year. You know, it's that added depth of experience that brings people in and genuinely gets them to appreciate wildlife. Like that, now that they've gone from that, they start what we call casual recording, or in mostly just recording presence of those species outside. 
And so like that, they're spending a little bit more time, but they want to start contributing back to the very people who trained them back at this stage, and they want to start supporting what we're doing and getting more involved, and hopefully they're getting more enthused for the activity of being outside and recording. After that then, what is what we call atlasing, but effectively asking people to go to specific locations. So rather than just randomly going around and finding things and telling us about them, actually, we need more information over here. Could you go over here, please? Or an increasingly systematic uh, approach to asking people to casually record. And then finally, right at the end, our sort of gold stars or angels, the people who actually go out and systematically monitor a particular uh, element of our wildlife. These are the people who take the most time and the most effort to get the best data uh, to conserve species. So we try to support people across all these different scales. So clearly, we have all these different modes of engagement and modes of effort. So they result in different types of data. So again, particularly you know, Donald has already gone through in terms of GBIF data, that they're moving more into sort of a sample space. But still, the vast majority of our data is really just this non-systematic spatial data. And with that, we can still, over decadal levels, we have to be clear about that, over maybe 10, 20 year periods, when you have large amounts of systematic data, then you can start looking at distributional change in a rigorous manner. Again, in terms of atlasing, as soon as you start integrating that sort of random approach with something a little bit more systematic, you can accelerate that time scale of which you can actually start measuring changes in distributions. And then at the shortest time scale, with the best data, again, we're talking anywhere from five to 10 years, you can start looking at population change. So like that, from all those different activities, we're starting to accumulate those data and start using data to do these different things as the data center matures. This is what comes out of all these things. So of course we have the, our dynamic maps on our website so you can see exactly what's been recorded and where. Um, after that then we support a whole range of different publications. So whether it's academics using our data and it's peer reviewed or it's grey literature and being used for environmental impact assessments. We support people using the data and publishing on the data. After that then, again over those more broader scale, longer time mapping initiatives, we have atlases. So people have a hard copy atlas. But for us, the atlas is just the start. The key thing is the red list that comes from that atlas. So from a, uh, someone who's gone out, just learnt about a particular species, has started recording a particular species, then goes looking further for that individual species, to someone who starts monitoring that species. We end up basically supporting everybody to get the evidence base for conservation in Ireland. That's what it's all about. And integrating all those different activities resulting in all these types of data analyses to produce these outputs. It's the evidence base for conservation. Like all our data, I, again, Liam uh, has already um, ex gone through this um, extensively, so I'll just be very, very quick. We have these excellent systems to capture data. So when you're out and you're doing a citizen science project, irrespective of where these systems capture your data, whether it's through our app or through our online recording systems. And again, these systems would have never even occurred if it wasn't for our uh, Adonis of uh, ICT manager, Barry O'Neill. So he makes it happen. And again, he's not thanked enough so no, uh, from Barry O'Neill. So ultimately, Barry systems and uh, with uh, uh, the uh, biodiversity informatics infrastructure that um, Compass Informatics ultimately provide us, all data are validated before they go on to these sort of high-end, high-value products, where we add value to those data to produce red lists, to inform conservation management, and to inform planning. But ultimately, it's still supporting all our uh, recorders to go through this particular experience and to support them to go on to be better and better uh, wildlife recorders. I won't talk about all those different levels. So for me specifically, my core role is supporting people doing insect monitoring within Ireland. So when we look, look at this wonderful network of insect monitors, so this is a little bit of a, a, an update. Uh, this is our 2017 picture of where people are recording in our monitoring schemes right now. You can see, look, it's a, it's a, it's a humbling network of wonderful people who go out, who give freely of our time to record these different insect groups. So again, the yellow triangles there is one of our all-island schemes. It's the bumblebee monitoring scheme where people walk a fixed route or a fixed time, recording all bumblebees within a fixed distance, uh, and they do this once per month from March until October, so eight times per year. Again, within our butterfly monitoring schemes, our full scheme, again, is very much like sort of the, the UK scheme or the Dutch scheme. You're effectively going out once per week from April until September, so 26 times a year. Again, the same methodology. It's a walk methodology. Again, we have a, a simplified version of this, um, for just getting a uh, population level change, called a five-visit scheme that's been implemented the last two years. 
And finally, the marsh battery monitoring scheme, which I'll go into a little bit of depth um, uh, just before the end. But fundamentally, it's a network of 238 people giving freely of their time to get the best data uh, for these groups. It's, it's, it's genuinely humbling the amount of time that they, they give us. So this was just 2017, almost 2,500 hours uh, spent in the field and just over four kilometers walked. Now immediately going, God, that's very slow. Well, it should be, they're counting insects. We don't want them lashing through on a bike or on a motorbike, you know, they're, they're adhering to the methodology and I can check it by that. So, you know, it's nice, but I mean, this is ultimately what they're generating and this is what we can generate with that data these genuine metrics of change. And again, unfortunately, in these cases, it is decline, but at least we have measures on it now. We can identify which species are in decline. We wouldn't have been able to do that effectively if these networks simply did not exist. And they only exist because of these wonderful people who go out every month or every week or every so often to do this. And then coming to the end, I just want to mention this particular one, the Marsh Battery Monitoring Scheme. So again, uh, within Ireland, this is an annex species under the EU Habitats Directive. So like that, it would be one of the more pr uh, sort of priority species for, for, for monitoring and management uh, within Ireland. But when we look at our network, and again, it's an all-island scheme, and it's a collaboration across a whole spectrum of different citizen scientists. Like I was alluding to at the start, it isn't just the general public. So for this particular scheme and the way we've designed it, um, it's actually been supported by 18 state staff, both in the south and in the north of Ireland. We also have 10 members from a variety of different NGO groups, so Butterfly Conservation Ireland, the Irish uh, Peatland Conservation Council, Wexford Natural Field Club, and then 13 very experienced butterfly volunteers who wanted to take their own training to the next step and really do something very systematic on these sites. So in this particular instance, not only are they actually going out measuring the species itself, they're actually doing a detailed habitat condition assessment too. So like that, we're moving from just asking our recorders to look at species, to actually looking at species and habitat conditions. So it's a, a little bit more involved. But again, they're generating great data. It's only three years old, so I won't show any data just yet. But again, in another maybe year or uh, uh, two years, so after five years, we'll have basically the best data for the species in Ireland. So just some future directions. So just a few things that I think are horizon scanning, what might be happening both in the data center and citizen science in, in general over the next few years. So number one, gamification. I mean, we talk about it a lot. And I, I like this particular one when we start talking about gamification, because most people think, oh, AI. We can start replacing recorders with cameras and uh, it will immediately start just identifying things without anybody being involved. No, we really don't want that. Uh, and again, it's actually very, very difficult to do. I can believe in five to ten years we're all, we, we'll get there. I think even our director, Liam Leistert, has used uh, an AI app and it got his dingy skipper down to the skipper family at least. So it's getting to that stage, but not down to species just yet. But like that, gamification can be a very, very powerful tool to uh, encourage citizen science. So this is a brilliant uh, article written by uh, Dr. Tom August in the CH in the UK. Um, literally two weeks after the Pokemo, Pokemon Go app was launched. And he calculated that within six days of re records coming in through the Pokemon Go app, it effectively achieved 400 years of wildlife sightings within the UK. So like that, I mean, it it's just illustrates what a powerful tool gamification can be. Again, I, don't, I haven't seen any uh, publications on it. I'd love to know how far people walked how actually, um, how physically active people got with this, particular, uh, with this particular app. I think, you know, it's an added benefit for getting people outside. But anyway, how can we take advantage of it? Well, it's something we're going to be exploring, but a, at a very modest level, again, we've implemented our recorder league, whereby people can go in, they can opt in voluntarily to be a member of this uh, recorder league, and uh, their name appears with the number of species they've recorded. And like that, you can filter this by, okay, the number of birds seen in May, who saw the most, or who saw the most dragonflies over 2016, etc. You can really start building up these tables of people who just want to get the most species. And great, I mean, facilitate that. If that's what they enjoy and they're giving freely of their time, go for it. Everybody wins. They get to do this thing and get to have a little bit of competition. Fine, absolutely great. And we get data. So, I mean, no, I think it, it, it's definitely, it's a powerful tool. Like I mentioned with uh, the Marsh Fertility Monitoring Scheme, right now we're very much concentrating on getting people out recording species. But at an, maybe a higher, more important level, recording the habitat that those species are in is actually very, very important too. So in some of our schemes, we can start uh, sort of 
including habitat condition assessments too. Again, you can imagine the level of training would be a little bit higher, but now that we've established this space of network, uh, this uh, network of citizen scientists, there's a demand there for it. There's people now who are going, okay, I've done this now. I'm going, you know, I've been doing this for eight, nine years and know exactly what I'm doing now. I'd like to do something new or something different. We can start including these particular steps and start getting sort of citizen science habitat level monitoring. And then moving even to ecosystem service level monitoring. And an excellent example would be sort of the Riverfly partnership within the UK or the Leafpack network over in the States, where ultimately they're asking people involved with freshwater systems, river systems, to go out, put a particular leaf pack uh, in uh, Northwest Europe, that's typically hazel leaves, of a known weight into the river, and then after a fixed period of time, remove it, and you can see how much your detrivores, all those macro invertebrates in that system, have chewed up all those leaves. And again, in the cleaner systems or the better functioning systems, that happens more rapidly than less functioning systems. So integrating those little elements of, of maybe going from species to habitat to ecosystem service, I mean, these are things we are, we are really going to be looking at over the next uh, uh, five years. And then finally, or almost finally, uh, so, uh, a huge untapped resource that we haven't really integrated fully yet with um, sort of ecological citizen science is geographical citizen science. So again, this publication came out three years ago. Um, it's ultimately a compilation of all the sort of crowdsourced geographic information that is now available uh, 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 for Europe. Like that, one of the key ones is the now rapidly growing community of people who fly drones for fun and have loads of imagery and video that they're not using, but would like it to be used, in this case, for conservation purposes. So there's now specific groups now trying to coordinate across their fellow uh, uh, drone pilots to go out and actually collect that information and then give it over to various different agencies to use for conservation purposes. And again, that whole workflow now has been uh, developed for a whole variety of different reasons and I think can be uh, very much used within to support what we're currently doing in citizen science and support it with geographic citizen science. And then the last point is just uh, the integration of all the above. It's what we call model assistant monitoring. So we can only really have, um, if we want to have very accurate measures of current and recent change, we have to have really effective monitoring. Like that, if we want to predict into the future, we have to really have really effective models. So integrating all these data together ultimately allows us to produce very accurate models to identify what's currently happening and what will happen, and then also how to better collect the data in future too. So um, with all these uh, uh, sort of future uh, 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 directions in combination with our current fantastic network of citizen science. I think we're uh, ideally placed to basically get the best data uh, and really uh, have the best conservation within Ireland. So thank you. <laughs>